I want to thank everyone for uh, the, taking the time this afternoon to participate in this webinar. This is a continuation of the uh, fact finding or gathering inputs by the National Academies Committee on Evaluation of Hydrodynamic Modeling and Implications for Offshore Wind Development uh, for the Nantucket Shoals area. And I am Eileen Hoffman. I have the honor of uh, being the chair of this committee. And um, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, so just to give you, uh, for those who are not familiar with the committee who may be logging in here, this is a statement of tasks for the committee. And um, basically what we're looking at is the effects of offshore wind turbine structures on local to regional scales of hydrodynamic processes and the scale of that effect relative to the change of natural variability. You can read the statement of tasks. There is this on the, uh, on the um, committee website um, if you're interested in that, as well as other information about the committee. Um, today, we're pleased to be here to hear um, Dr. Andy Pershing talk to us. But before we begin that, I think I'd like to ask the committee members to please briefly introduce themselves and um, just say where you are, and um, we'll uh, then we'll go ahead with the webinar. And that way, Dr. Pershing will know who he's talking to. All right. So I'm going to go in the order that's given here. As I said, my name is Eileen Hoffman, and I'm at Old Dominion University. I'm an oceanographer with interest in physical biological uh, interactions. So Jeff Carpenter, if you're here, yes, please, if you would introduce yourself, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Jeff Carpenter. I'm a physical oceanographer in Germany at the Helmholtz Center, Herion, uh, close to Hamburg. And um, my research interests are in small scale turbulent flows, um, as well as the offshore wind farm problem. Okay, thank you. Um, Jim, if you're here. Uh, perhaps he's not joined yet. Okay. Um, Josh Kohat. Kohut is unable to um, uh, join today's webinar because of another obligation. Um, Richard, if you would please introduce yourself. So I'm Richard Merrick. I'm retired from NOAA Fisheries. My last gig with them, though, is as chief scientist. Um, I'm here in part because of my background working with right whales. Okay, thank you. Um, Aaron, please. Hi, I'm Aaron Meyer Gutbrod. I'm an assistant professor at the University of South Carolina. Um, and some of my work includes looking at oceanac oceanographic drivers to right whale distribution and demography. Okay, thank you. Um, Doug? Yep, thanks, Eileen. Uh, welcome, Andy. Uh, I'm Doug Nowacek. I'm at Duke University, and uh, I work on right whale bioacoustics and behavioral ecology, and uh, including foraging ecology. Okay, thank you. Um, Doug? That was me. Yeah, I'm sorry, Doug. I'm, I can't read this afternoon, it would appear. Okay, Kaus, please. Hi, uh, I'm Kaus Raghukumar. Uh, I'm at Integral Consulting uh, in Santa Cruz, California. Uh, my, my, uh, my, my research interests are in uh, uh, underwater acoustics and physical oceanography. Uh, and I'm here because of, uh, of some work we've been doing on the West Coast, looking at the effects of offshore wind farms on uh, coastal upwelling. Okay, thank you. Um, Nick, please. Uh, he may not have been able to join yet. Okay, I think Jim Chen just has joined. So Jim, if you're here, would you please introduce yourself? Yep. Uh, hi, I'm Jim Chen. I have some difficulty logging. Uh, so yeah, I'm a professor at uh, Northeastern University in the Department of Civil Environmental Engineering. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, doing a coastal uh, modeling in general. Okay, thank you. Um, so that that's the committee. Um, the, uh, who just introduced themselves. And as I said, the webinar we're holding today is a continuation of the committee's uh, work in uh, gathering information that will be incorporated into the report that we're writing. And the report should be hopefully finished later uh, this year in, in early fall. But I think in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and get started with the webinar. And we're very pleased today to have Dr. Andy Pershing as a, a presenter for the webinar. Dr. Pershing is the Vice President for Science for Climate um, Central, 
which is a group of scientists who form an independent climate communications group that provides information about changing climate and its effect on people and society. Prior to joining Climate Central, Dr. Pershing was the Chief Scientific Officer for the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, where he also led the Climate Change Ecology Lab. And he was also a member of the uh, Marine Science Faculty at the University of Maryland. Um, Dr. Pershing has published extensively on the Northwest Atlantic, uh, uh, marine ecosystems in the Northwest Atlantic Ocean. And his presentation today on zooplankton community changes in the Northwest Atlantic will provide us hopefully with an overview of how this important component of the marine ecosystem is changing and changing in response to the climate change. So Dr. Pershing, please go ahead. All right. Thank you so much for giving me a chance to talk to you. Uh, it's so great to see many of you. Um, I, you know, spent a lot of time thinking about copepods and right whales, uh, time, you know, throughout my career. Uh, moved to Climate Central about two and a half years ago to really focus on the climate problem. Uh, and it's great to, to get a chance to put my head back into whales uh, uh, today, or at least, uh, at least into some copepod stuff. So uh, I'm going to present um, some results that uh, that Adam Kemberling from the Gulf of Maine Research Institute and I uh, have currently have in review at the ICES Journal. Um, it very much follows on other work that uh, that we've done looking at zone plankton community dynamics in the Northwest Atlantic. So I'm going to uh, start by talking about zooplankton community changes in the Gulf of Maine uh, and specifically trying to ask the question, why does Calinus decline sometimes and why is it low right now? Uh, and this is going to, uh, as I said, um, bu uh, build very strongly on this uh, new paper that we're um, that we're hoping to get out here later in the year. Uh, and then I'm going to try to pull together just a few, some of my synthesis of how to think about the connection between warming and whales. And I expect that a lot of this uh, won't be new to you, especially given the composition of the folks on your panel. So uh, I'm going to start with how we sample plankton in the Northwest Atlantic. There are lots of ways to sample plankton. The continuous plankton recorder, which is the instrument here, is not the best one, but it is the best one for doing it for a long period of time uh, and over space, right? The great thing about the continuous plankton recorder was, was that it was invented in the 1930s by Sir Alistair Hardy using the very latest of clockwork technology available in the 1930s. Uh, think about propellers and gears. I mean, they're really beautiful. They're sort of like a Swiss watch that you can uh, tow behind uh, a ship. Uh, but the cool thing about a plank about the CPR is that it gives you a spatial record of plankton abundance. They can be towed from commercial ships traveling at their normal speed, which is pretty remarkable. So you can get uh, a record along the route of a ship, uh, a ship as it's transiting across the Atlantic. And we have the opportunity to, from the continuous plankton recorder to get very long-term records. Uh, the Marine Biological Association in the UK, which took over from the Sir Alistair Hardy Foundation for Ocean Sciences, the, the Global Continuous Plankton Recorder Surveys, has records in some places that go back to uh, you know, the late 40s and early 50s. Uh, so it really is a remarkable data set uh, that we can use to understand impact on, of uh, climate change on ecosystems. In the Gulf of Maine and the Northwest Atlantic, uh, the continuous plankton survey started in 1961. It was operated by the National Marine Fisheries Service um, and it ran more or less continuously. There was a gap uh, for a couple of years in the 1970s, but more or less continuously uh, starting in 1961. In 2014, um, the kind of sequestration budget challenges that I'm sure Richard can tell you all about uh, started to happen, uh, and the continuous plankton recorder survey fell out of the uh, out of the NIMS budget. The Marine Biological Association of the UK uh, resumed funding the route. The route they were able to pay to have the uh, have the route continue, but they weren't able to fund the sample processing. So they were collecting the data. The samples were just being stored uh, in a warehouse in the UK. And also at that time, the route shifted from the blue domain here in the south to the pink domain in the north because the ship that they were using shifted its home port from Boston to Portland, Maine. Uh, in, 20, in 2017, uh, Marine Biological Association decided they could no longer support the route. Uh, and so they paused uh, the, the, uh, the route in, at the end of 2017. Uh, and so I'm gonna be looking at the data up through that period. 
Um, thankfully, uh, in part through the through the need to understand the impact of uh, of changes in the plankton community on right whales, uh, the survey has resumed uh, with uh, funding from the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, and with the survey managed and the samples being processed uh, in the UK by the Marine Biological Association. So when we take all of the data, we can we can throw it uh, through various uh, uh, you know ways of trying to understand what's going on with a particular species. We remove the annual cycle. We look at anomalies off of the annual cycle, and that's this abundance index that uh, that I've been working with for uh, throughout most of my career. Uh, and so we can do this for and here's seven uh, seven major zooplankton taxa. These are the zooplankton taxa in this region that are consistently sampled and, and are represented. Uh, in many of the of the plankton samples that get collected. Um, so we're gonna talk about a couple of them, obviously Calanus finmarchicus, which is the main prey item for the North Atlantic right whale. And I'm gonna contrast uh, Calanus with Centropodes, and you'll see why uh, in, in a minute. But one of the things I want you to know as we look at these two species is how similar many of these time series are. Centropodes, the Oethonids, uh, Matridia, uh, the Pseudocalanus paracalanus, they all have this high 90s, low 2000s kind of time uh, regime shift like time series. Uh, and that's an important thing that, that will come out of the analysis. So we have a lot of data here. The challenge is how do we make sense of it? Uh, and so we've been working with pr um, principal components analysis for a long time. Uh, it's a way of summarizing a multivariate data set and trying to reduce the dimensionality. Uh, and so this is what I'm showing here is the loadings, the principal component loadings uh, for those taxa that I showed in the previous graph. So the orange bars indicate the strength of the loading for under the first mode, the leading mode, explain, explains 53% of the variance in the data. The blue is the loading on the second mode, which explains about 29% of the variance. You'll notice that the orange bars go up for centropogies and the blue bars go down for calanus. Okay, so this is our two modes. We have one mode, mode one, that really is the average abundance of the non-calanus copepods, we'll call, I usually call it the small copepod mode, uh, although keeping in mind centropages is not actually that small. We then have mode two, which is very much calanus, but with some of the other larger subarctic species also factoring in as well, but it's really our calanus mode. Um, one thing I wanna point out is that these uh, associations that are represented here have been very stable through time. We first looked at them in a paper that I wrote in 2005. We found almost exactly the same mode. One of the things that we do uh, in our recent paper that Adam and I have worked on is looked at just different 20 year periods. And we see the same, the same sets of associations persisting even though the Gulf of Maine is much different now than it was when the survey started in 1961. So it's kind of, a, I think, a, a notable result. The other thing I wanna point out is while I'm specifically talking about the Gulf of Maine, I know that this committee is really interested in what's going on in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, in a paper that we wrote in 2010, we not only found that there were similar zooplankton uh, associations throughout the Northwest Atlantic from basically from New York uh, up to Newfoundland. Um, but we also see that the Mid-Atlantic Bite, the plankton community there is very strongly correlated with the Gulf of Maine. Uh, there, there is plankton data from the Mid-Atlantic uh, from a, a route running out of New York City. Uh, and we have not had a chance to look at that yet. Uh, okay, so again, Calanus, we're gonna keep contrasting Calanus, which has its very, it's, it's the main member of the second mode. And then we have Centropogies, which is an important component of the leading mode and, and is just kind of a good indicator species for that mode. If we look at the time series now that are represented by those two modes, you can see that the orange mode has this very strong regime shift like pattern, low in the 90s, high in the, uh, sorry, low in the 80s, high in the 90s, low in the 2000s, and then it's gone back up uh, in over the last uh, five to seven years. Uh, whereas our Calanus mode uh, is in the blue. And so if we just think of this from the point of view of Calanus, right, because we're, we're thinking about the whales, uh, the 1980s, uh, we had high Calanus in the 1980s, and we had high Calanus in the early 2000s, and we have low Calanus in the 1990s, and low Calanus recently in the 2010s. And just to kind of drive home the whale point, 
During the 1980s, the right whale population, as far as we know, was growing. The right whale population was also growing in the early 2000s. When Calanus was low in the 1990s, the population was declining. Calves were not being produced faster than, uh, than, than, the, than mortality. Uh, and similarly, we're now dealing with a stress population uh, that's dealing with low food uh, and low uh, calf production. Okay, so what drives the plankton changes? This is an important question that we've tried to uh, you know, answer at different points uh, throughout, um, you know, over the decades where we've been studying this. This is a time series of sea surface temperature that the Gulf of Maine Research Institute uh, produced. Uh, so you can see, you know, how rapidly this region has warmed, especially the, the you know, the warming uh, after 2010. We really almost like jumped into a different temperature regime uh, right around 2010. Uh, and that's driving a lot of how we think about this system. But remember, we have our low calinus periods, right? We have low calinus was in low in the 1990s, which was when it was cold, as well as the 2000s when it's hot. When it's hot, so we have this kind of a little bit of a tension. So temperature is not telling us the whole story. It's not a simple temperature story, although we think the temperature is really what's driving a lot of the dynamics now. What we think is going on here, and I'll try to make uh, make this case a little bit more explicitly, is that is that stratification is really important, and temperature in recent so both of these conditions, hot or fresh, are associated with higher stratification. Right, you have uh, dense water, sorry, low density water sitting on top of high density water. That's the situation that we get every year in the summer. Uh, and so one of the ways of interpreting these plankton community changes is that we really are just taking the summer, uh, the summer plankton regime and expanding it throughout the season. And we can, we can see that sometimes in the seasonal cycles. Okay, uh, so there's the seasonality to this. So in the paper that Adam and I put together, one of the things we did was we tried to look in detail uh, over the last, uh, say, 17 years, since, since 2001, and to take advantage of the high frequency daily hydrographic data that we have from the Nyrakus buoy array. And so we took all of, the, all of the buoy data, temperature and salinity at all of the depths, at all of the buoys in the Gulf of Maine, and we throw it into, again, another principal component, we get the, that the leading mode is basically just the average conditions and, it, uh, and, it's, and it's temperature and salinity average together. So, uh, so what a high, uh, uh, high value in this buoy principal component one means is warm and salty, which has been the dominant conditions uh, in the Gulf of Maine over the last few years. Okay, so what I'm showing here in this figure uh, on the left are each, or each quarter, uh, so Q1, so when, and I'm associating Q1 with, in this case, Q1 in Centropogy's abundance, Q2 in Centropogy's, Q3, Q4. So you can see that when Q1 has, uh, is warm and salty, Centropogy's is high. When Q1 is warm and salty, we also tend to see it high uh, at Q3, right? And so we get these kind of somewhat persistent uh, changes. For Calanus, we don't see as many significant relationships, but we do see a significant negative relationship between the buoy uh, between the buoy conditions in Q3 uh, in the summer and Calanus in Q3, and that we think is really critical. Uh, so we compared it with buoy data 2001 through 2017. Mode one in the buoy is hot and salty. Okay, so we tend to see that when Cal when centropogies increases, the Calanus decreases. And we can see that here. So when uh, when Calanus is 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 high, Centropogies is low. So if Calanus is high in Q3, Centropogies is low. If Calanus is low in Q3, Centropogies is high, and it persists. And this is one of the one of the messages is that we think that Calanus is generally leading the dynamics, and Centropogies is following and giving this persistence to the kind of giving us this kind of regime shift like response. Um, so you can see this here as well. So this is if centropogies lead centropogies, obviously it's very correlated, uh, but centropogies tends to persist. So if it's high in Q1, it tends to be high throughout the rest of the year. So you can think of this of an event as really starting in Q3. For example, it, if it's warm in Q3, Calanus declines. And that leads to an increase opposite sign relationship with centropogies throughout the year that persists. 
So the hypothesis, the mechanism that we're dealing with here is that we have a plankton community, we then expose it to warming, or we can look at individual heat waves. That, uh, and that manifests itself most strongly in the summer, leading to an increase in the smaller copepods, leading to a decrease in calinus, or I'm Xing out a calinus. And then we get, in some ways, almost an amplification of that process throughout the year, uh, because uh, as uh, as it persists on into the summer. And so we end up with more of the small copepods the next summer and fewer calinus. And that gets reinforced because in many cases, we also have persistence uh, in the heating as well, right? We're dealing with a trend. It's not like we were, were hot and then go back to cold. So here's a whole page of references. I'm gonna uh, leave this with the committee because what I wanna do is actually try to use these references and walk through just a few a bits of evidence uh, that we have about how some of these things are connected. So in my synthesis, we're gonna start with calinus decreasing. We're gonna think about a decrease in calinus leading to an increase in, a, in centropogies. Okay, we have evidence from that in terms of the community dynamics that have been persistent over a long period of time from you know, some of our earlier papers, like my, my paper in 2005, paper in 2010, uh, and then the recent work that I just presented uh, with Adam Kemberlein are uh, calling that PK23. So each of these little ovals represents a study. We, know, we of course know that uh, that the temperatures are rising, and we know that temperature that warm that the warming has led to a decrease in calinus. So Nick Recker did important work on that in 2019 using uh, plankton data from the MarMap data set. Uh, um, um, Aaron Meyer Goodbrod uh, with Chuck Green and, and others reinforced that using some of the continuous plankton recorded data that I presented, but using some different physical drivers showing that as the warming has happened, the calinus has declined. And then we come in as well with, uh, with our re more recent work uh, kind of reinforcing that. We also know that when calinus declines, that the number of right well calves decline. This is a very consistent relationship throughout the time series. Uh, uh, Chuck Green and I first noticed that in 2004. Uh, lots of folks have looked at that throughout the years, including Erin uh, in her work in, in 2021, uh, as well as some, uh, some of her earlier papers. And then we also know that right well distributions are sensitive to, uh, to calinus as well. And when, uh, when calinus changes on an interannual basis, we see right whales shifting where they feed and when they feed in the Gulf of Maine. So this was work that Dan Pendleton did uh, uh, in back in 2009. Uh, and then Nick Record reinforced this uh, with his analysis uh, going between the, uh, the Gulf of Maine and the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And so finally, just kind of one more way of thinking about the future. Warming is going to continue. There's no way that that is not going to happen. May get a cold year here and there, but the cold years are going to be less frequent and they're going to be less cold. That means that good calinus years are going to be increasingly scarce in the Gulf of Maine uh, and especially uh, further to the south. And that means that our right wells are going to be on the move. Uh, and so this is just a diagram depicting this and some of the other community changes uh, in the Gulf of Maine from uh, the Gulf of Maine 2050 review paper that we published a few years ago. And I'm going to I'm going to stop there, uh, and I would love to have a discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, that was very, very interesting, and um, some very interesting ideas and thoughts there. So I'll open this up for uh, questions. If anyone has a question, so let's see. Any questions? Um, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, Jeff, go ahead, please. Yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, as a physical oceanographer, I'm, I'm, I kind of missed a little bit the connection to the stratification. You said it's not just a temperature story. Um, so, are is it really increases and decreases in total stratification that are making changes, or or how is that connected then? Yeah, that's a so. This is something that we've been trying to figure out for a long time because you know the big the first thing that really got us thinking about stratification was in the 1990s. So we had in the 1990s this pulse of very uh, very fresh water that came into the Gulf of Maine. Actually, you know, kind of came down the the uh, the whole you know shelf system from the Northwest Atlantic, 
and led to these persistent plankton community changes. Uh, and so that led to a number of papers that Chuck Green and I and others wrote talking about hypothesizing that stratification was was what connected uh, was what was driving the plankton dynamics. So the idea was that the the fresh the reduced salinity uh, allowed the the uh, the seasonal stratification to um, to increase or to, to start fast or start earlier in the year. Uh, it changed some of the phytoplankton bloom dynamics, and that affected the phyto the the zooplankton community. So it was sort of the hypothesis we were working working on then. Um, I'd say now the it's it's just really interesting to see that we get almost exactly the same community structure emerge uh, in this new climate. Even though the water is, uh, you know, a couple of degrees Celsius on average warmer uh, than it used to be, um, and we we think that it's that 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 the stratification dynamics are having a similar kind of effect. So the fact that it's warmer, we're moving into that or into the summer more stratified period earlier in the year, and so that keeps Calanus uh, numbers down. Yeah. Yeah, please, Doug, go ahead. I'm actually going to go on to something slightly different, Eileen, uh, if Aaron wants to follow up on any yeah. of that. Yeah, okay. Aaron, did you have a follow-up for that comment? Um, sure, a little bit. Um, okay. I was wondering, Andy, have you or are you thinking about looking at these community dynamics and comparing them with an actual index of stratification, uh, like perhaps a mixed layer depth or something that's trying to combine both the the freshness and the warmth of the water. Yeah. So, Aaron, this is a something that we've tried to do. Uh, you know, I've tried to find good stratification time series. You know, periodically throughout my career, and I have to say, I've never found one that seemed consistent. So, we've always tended to do this by you know via proxies, right? Like with the with SST or with this buoy time series that does have the temperature and salinity mixed in, or with the like the, um, you know, some of the stuff that, you know, that you, you and Chuck have done with the, like the slope water indices. So it's always been a little bit by proxy. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I would say that like the stratification is still, it's still in a bit of a hypothesis mode where that's what we, we kind of hypothesize that that's the mechanism. Um, the best I think the most kind of mechanistic, the closest we've gotten to a really good mechanistic description of how this might work was some of the modeling work that Rubao G did uh, around some of the uh, like the late 90s um, uh, freshwater events. Uh, and so he looked at, he was running a model looking at the freshwater events and how that affected the, the phenology of the phytoplankton blooms. Um, um doug did you want to yeah, yeah yeah thanks thanks again andy for for coming in and, and sharing this with us i um not that it necessarily helps right whales but i'm kind of curious as to if you have thoughts about the overall biomass um numbers uh regardless of the well i mean taking into account the the community structure but then the you know if it impacts the overall biomass um, yeah so so bi biomass in you know, biomass, the biomass of plankton in the Gulf of Maine is to first order how much calanus biomass you have. Calanus is just so much bigger and so much more productive that you know you really don't see that this compensation. Um, and, and you know, and the right whales, I think, are a great indicator of that. You know, we saw with the work that you know that Dan Pendleton uh, and Nick Record and I were doing in the you know in the yeah, you know, you know the, uh, right around 2010, we were looking at, uh, you know, at how whales were, you know, kind of the timing of when whales shift from moving from Cape Cod Bay to the Great South Channel, and how many would come to the Great South Channel, and it and it really Calanus was just a really good indicator of that. These smaller copepods, there's you know there's evidence that the whales eat them. It's probably important, but it's like the you know it's the salad it's the salad course before uh, before the big meal. Right. That's, I think, the way, the, certainly the way Stormy Mayo has always characterized it. Any other questions? Um, yeah, Aaron, go ahead. And then I'd like to ask when we are done. So go ahead. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, Andy, this one is unfair. It's the kind of question that everybody hates, but I'm going to try and ask you to extrapolate a bit beyond the bounds of your study because you're using the CPR data and you're finding this push and pull between the late stage Calanus and Marchicus and, you know, the centropogies, the smaller bugs. And here, the point of this committee is to assess the hydro hydrodynamic impacts of turbines in the Nantucket Shoals mm -hmm. region. And so in that region, you know, I have the sense that centropogies and those smaller bugs already have kind of a stronger foothold in the zooplankton community relative to where your CPR is running. So given that challenge, do you have any ability to speculate, you know, how that sort of difference in community farther south could sort of map onto the things that you found with these seasonal dynamics? Yeah, so I think the way the I guess the mental model I would I would have would be I think the one that we've tried you know that we developed over the years with you know with Cape Cod Bay that you know it's a it's a coastal environment so you're going to get you know a little bit more uh, action from some of the a little more of the coastal species so Centropogies, Pseudocalanus, right Acacia probably is going to be important there at, you know at some points during the year and. And you know, with Calanus coming in perhaps in pulses, right, coming out of the Gulf, out of the Gulf, um, Great South Channel, you know, advecting down the, the shelf in pulses. So, it's 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 interesting to me that like when um, Dan Pendleton, some of his uh, modeling work, uh, actually, you know, was looking at some of the habitat qual the habitat suitability for right whales based on the Gulf, uh, based on the uh, Cape Cod Bay, and was finding you know a lot of similarity between Cape Cod Bay and this Nantucket Shoals region. So in some ways, kind of predict you know predicted that this might be an area that whales would find uh, you know appealing in the way that Cape Cod Bay is. But as far as it like driving their driving the whales population dynamics. I don't think that's likely to be the case. I think that, you know, Calanus is really what determines how many, you know, how, how many calves you produce uh, each year. And, you know, the, the, the areas south, south of the Cape um, are just not going to have the, mm. you know, the abundance of Calanus. And they're definitely not going to have the abundance of Calanus, you know, as we move into, you know, a quarter of a degree or half a degree more of warming. Yeah, I mean, you know, I love thinking about Calanus and right whale calving, um, but I, I guess the task of the committee will have to look beyond that because if there's food enough to draw right whales into the area, which in recent years there has been, part of the charge is, you know, how will the placement of turbines impact prey availability, which could then impact mm -hmm. right whale use of that area? You know, could it be drawing them in? Or could it just, you know, the placement of turbines disperse them? So we are thinking sort of beyond just the demographic impacts and, and more into the distribution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> that was um, somewhat similar to the question I was going to ask was that could you speculate where right whale habitat is going to move over the, say, you know, in response to the climate changes that you're you're that are being are going on now. Yeah. So you know, Dan Pendleton, I actually you know wrote put put together a bit a bit of a speculative piece that uh, that was in oceanography, I think, last summer. Uh, that was just really kind of trying to think through the challenges that the whales have as they're mm -hmm. as they're trying to adapt to this new this new world, right? I mean, you just think about the whales; they've had you know probably a thousand years to figure out how to like make a living in the Gulf of Maine. Now we've warmed it up and we've made it much, you know, we've made it different. And so now the whales are having to go and figure out how to like, how to string it together in, you know, in a new, in a new ocean. And probably about the point they figure that out, it's going to change again, right? That's, that's what climate change is. We're going to just keep pressing on, uh, on this species. So, we we actually did a little bit of uh, you know some some kind of loose mapping work based on some of the sea surface temperature projections. Sort of suggested that you know as the as things warm up, you're going to see you know that the habitat you know core habitat shift to places like the Gulf of St. Lawrence, core habitat shift mm -hmm. to places like uh, like Newfoundland. But I, I think this core habitat model it can be a little bit 
deceptive because the whales are, I mean, they're, they're explorers. They're having to figure out how to make a living in the ocean. And so I think they're, they're spending, a, having to spend a lot more time, you know, moving around, um, and trying to figure out where, uh, you know, where the, you know, where good feeding is. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Richard, please. Yeah. So to continue on the stratification topic, um, it appears over the last decade plus that the, that area in the Nantucket Shoals area, not the Shoals itself, but the area where the wind farm projects are, has actually become more stratified, at least in time, such that it's extending significantly farther into the fall and probably into the spring. So one of the questions that emerges to us as we're looking at the effect these turbines could have, is if it does change the stratification and perhaps make it less stratified, can you speculate on what that might do to right whale and colonists? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's if if you were to make it less stratified, you know, you might be able to get, you know, cool, cool things down in the, you know, in the wake of the turbines, perhaps it might, um, you know, give you, you know, changes in the in the productivity, perhaps, but I just I don't see it making a big enough it having a big enough spatial footprint to affect calendars on like a, you know, kind of a population level, um, mostly just because the water is just going to be passing through there, uh, you know, fairly rapidly. So you might, if you imagine like a water mass going through, might get mixed up mm -hmm. a little bit, it might sort of tip the balance a little more favorably towards calendars, you know, for a few days, and then it, then it sort of moves through. Okay. Yeah. And I think that, um, just answered the question in the chat here about reduced stratification in the region of wind turbines and uh, the potential effects of that on the colonist population. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other um, comments or questions while, we're, while we have Dr. Pershing's undivided attention here? So. Yes, please, Nick, go ahead. And then Jeff, yeah. Hi, Andy. Uh, and thanks for the talk, that was great. Um, just thinking about like the big shifts that hap happen, happened and could continue to happen. And if you're thinking about like, you put in, say a bunch of turbines go in and then say colonists is being measured and it you know goes through another like sort of big change how how could one distinguish that change you know attribute it to the turbines versus one of the other type of big sort of surprising shifts that we've seen in the past yeah a great great question it's i think i would really think of it in terms of the the spatial scale that the you know the things that we're talking about with the you know with the continuous plankton recorder data or with the mar map to, you know time series really are looking at Calanus uh, as like a, you know, as a kind of a, I've always thought of it as like a kind of a population level, you know, the total abundance of Calanus in a region. And we, we see that changing, uh, you know, more or less, in, you know, together, right, at, with the, with the spatial, with the footprint of the physics. So I would say like, if you, you know, if you were to have sampling and you showed that, you know, somehow, you know, Calanus, uh, you know, you know, really went down at the wind, you know, the wind sites, uh, I would say that if you if you don't see a similar decline, you know, at this larger spatial scale, then uh, you know, then you then you'd be able to say that that was you know that that was more likely due to the um, to the installations. But if you you know if you really are just seeing at your local site something that's just part of the the kind of the broader footprint, um, I, I I think that you would say that it's more more related to the to the larger scale dynamics. And I think you know for Calanus there. Um, there's some really great papers. My, one of my favorite papers, um, Oxnes and Blindheim, I forget the year. I love it so much. You'd think I could remember the year. Uh, but they just did, you know, really kind of a really interesting, just almost like a back of the envelope scaling argument of like how, uh, you know, basically what's the what's the spatial area that drives Calanus dynamics or by which you would see, uh, you would see different, you would see changes in Calanus. And that's surprisingly large. 
given how, because they live, uh, you know, for a relatively long time relative to other copepods, you end up getting, you know, the, it's, it's kind of on the scale of, you know, at least one of the deep basins, if not the whole Gulf of Maine. Right. Okay. Thank you. And Jeff. Yeah. Um, one thing that we heard about in earlier talks was the, the distribution vertically in the water column of, of Calanus and that they form these sort of concentrated layers. Um, and that can also be correlated with the stratification. Um, and I guess one effect of the wind farms could be to sort of disperse these um, vertically in the water column. Um, can you maybe comment on on those kinds of effects? Yeah, so in, you know, in the work that we were doing, um, you know, kind of the late 2000s, we were, we were really kind of grappling with this, this difference in scales, right, between the kind of the, you know, the, the Gulf of Maine scale, Cape Cod Bay, or, you know, Gulf, Great South Channel scale, and then this, you know, hyper local scale that the, that the whales are actually feeding on. And, you know, the, 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 the kind of the, at least like the heuristic model that we, that we had was that, that, that you have these, you know, the, the large scale physics are essentially setting the, you know, the total abundance in the region, determining whether you have, whether you have a good calendar this year or not. And then you have, and then you run them through the various local dynamics that determine whether you get patches or not, because we, at least for the thing, play, things, places that we were studying, there doesn't seem to be a big, you know, big difference year to year in the tides in the, in, you know, in Cape Cod Bay that would determine the patch structure or in the, you know, in the outflow of the, you know, the Gulf of Saint, uh, of the Great South Channel. Um, it really was like, you know, are you, are you putting a lot of calanus into the blender or are you not putting a lot of calanus into the blender? Um, so that's kind of how we would, how we would think about it. I would assume that the, you know, that the wind turbine uh, impacts would be, you know, stable and consistent through time uh, and that it really is kind of how how much you, what your input is into the into the system yeah you think it's more of a like a total biomass effect or you think the total biomass effect is much bigger than say the vertical distribution i well it's i mean it it's a they're they go they go hand in hand. So if you have a place where uh, where where the physics create these kind of uh, you know stable or you know high intensity aggregations that the whales really cue in on, and then you feed it with a lot you know with a high background concentration of calanus, that's going to give you your you know really good feeding. That's what the whales the whales need both of these things to be true. Uh, okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, there is a question from Pat Halpern in the chat here and asking, are the decadal low and high periods related to NAO cycles in any way? Yeah, I mean, that was, that was, you know, the NAO was a big part of what, how we were thinking about the kind of the, the, the natural climate variability side of this in, you know, in the work we were doing in the nineties and two thousands. Um, you know, NAO is, is certainly out there. It's, it's a less, um, I've found it to be a, a less reliable predictor than it used to be. Um, you know, it could just be a longer time series and we're kind of, you know, getting to the point of, of understanding it. But, um, you know, the big changes that we've seen lately are more related to, to these kind of larger oceanographic changes in the Northwest Atlantic, like, you know, the slowdown in the meridional overturning circulation, you know, that's probably a big part of the warming that we've seen in this region. Um, and that's certainly, you know, something that, you know, has come out of the work that Nick and Aaron have done. Hey, thank you. Uh, yes, I believe um, Dipanja Malik, do you have a question? Your hand is up. Um, do you want to put your question in the chat, perhaps? Yeah, am I audible? Hi, we can hear you now. Yes, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, well, are there any other questions while we're waiting? I guess that, okay. Okay, I guess not. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, yes, Tom, 
Kilpatrick, please. Yeah, I, I had a question, oh. if I'm allowed to ask. This is Tom Kilpatrick from Boehm. Um, so just on the, along the same lines of that NAO question, um, so the first plot you showed, the SST warming way above trend, oh and you just mentioned you mentioned that might be due to mock slowdown. So I was wondering, then, is that thought to be um, kind of like decadal variability that could reverse, or is it more thought to be that like climate change is just having like a this rapid and more intense impact in this area, like polar amplification kind of analog um, in the ocean? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. That is that is something that we tried to address in a couple of the studies that came out of the Gulf of Maine 2050 um, effort of, uh, back in 2019. Um, so that we, you, you know, it's, there are, there are, um, projection models that have the Gulf of Maine warming at the rate that we've seen at this much, you know, much exaggerated or above, you know, above average or certainly above average for the global ocean rate. Um, there's some of the models for this region where that don't have quite that, um, that kind of local climate sensitivity. Uh, and so those models would tend to suggest that this is a that this is more of a you know a cycle on top of warming. Um, so you know I'd say we don't quite know that answer yet. Um, my sense is that this you know the warming has really persisted, uh, and if anything is you know continued to increase. Right, 2022 was you know was even warmer than you know the big heat wave of years that we had in 2012 and 2016. Um, so, you know, it, it does look more and more, I, I'd say every year that it stays warm, uh, you know, you're, you're adding evidence to the, to, the, uh, to the suggestion that this is more of a trend and not a cycle. Hmm. But I'd say, you know, even if it is, even if it is cyclical, uh, you know, if there's like a, you know, switch in the AMO sort of event, um, you know, you're, you're not going to cool down to conditions that you had in the 1990s. You know, at best, you're going to cool down to the you know, the conditions we had maybe in 2010. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Okay. Um, would you like to, um, Dipanja and Malik, would you want to try again? Yes. Am I audible now? Yes, you are. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my question is that can I, uh, can we think of, uh, since the turbine, I mean, uh, setting up of the turbines and the, is it audible? You're, you're breaking yeah. up. Hello? Yeah, it's okay. I think that's not, um, yeah. Yeah, there was a disturbing sound, so I just had to uh, strike it off. Uh, my question is that we, what we can understand that the turbine setting up these turbines and the climate change are impacting the habitat of the whales. Uh, we can understand it from the the excellent modeling. Now, can uh, we create some guiding path for the whales so that they can find the uh, their new habitat more easily by using our models? Um, so, you know, if I understand your question correctly, is there, you know, you're, you're asking basically, is there anything that we can do that could kind of help the whales find, you know, more suitable habitat or adjust, you know, more rapid, more mm -hmm. keep up with the changes in the ocean? And I'd say, you know, there, there really isn't anything we can do um, in, you know, in that respect. And so it really is just about reducing mortality to zero, right? It's, you know, reducing the amount of rope in the water, it's reducing the speed of the vessels, you know, making sure that we're, we're trying to get mortality as close to zero as possible. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, are there any other questions to um, follow up here? Okay, well, if not, then um, Andy, thank you so much. Um, we, your comments will be very useful as we go forward with writing this report, and we're very likely to be coming back to you with some questions. And um, but anyway, but thank you very much for taking the time and for providing such a useful um, presentation for the for the committee. So I'll ask one more time if there are any other comments, and if not, then I think we'll end our webinar here. All right. Thanks a lot. It was fun.
Thank you. It, it was uh, really informative. I learned a lot. So thank you. I, I loved getting to think about whales today. I've yeah. been spending most of my time thinking about heat in Texas. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not a good place to be right now. So, and I can say that as someone who used to live there. So, <laughs> anyway, all right. Thank you. And thank everybody for your participation. And, um, and we'll go forward with our report. So thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you, thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Arlene.